So they want to know if I pray for him. So I want to make sure that I got, got him on tape that I pray for him. So remember to pray for, for Edie and uh, hopefully she'll be home today. And uh, Lorene, unfortunately, has to come back from Tennessee to, uh, to, to take care of things. So pray for her for traveling mercies also. Uh, Ruth Weckford, continue to pray for her as she's uh, uh, battling uh, her cancer issues. And, and my friend, Dr. George Thomas, uh, who's still on dialysis, but he is moving back from Florida to, to uh, Kankakee. Uh, so that'd be good to be in the area. So Charlie Ure uh, 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 is uh, Amy, uh, dad and Brenda, the, her mom, uh, he has uh, cancer, uh, lung cancer, and I think it's the kind that you have from uh, asbestos, you know, that, that he was, uh, I believe, in the, in the, yeah, you think I was going to try to say that, honey? I mean, there's no, there's, there's no way, I can't even say Schmidt, my last name, let alone, you know, very well, so yeah, so, Mizzle, yes, yeah, see, I told you, Told you, yeah, yeah, that one that you have from uh, asbestos and stuff. He was in the shipyard, so keep him in prayer and, and continue to pray for Chris and Bill as she navigates some of the uh, uh, issues she has. Uh, for my two Cindy's, uh, that uh, Cindy is doing doing pretty good, and so my two Cindy's and uh, our three children, Noah, uh, who is a six month old who has a problem with the heart valve, and uh, Zamora. Uh, she had a kind of a bad week. Uh, she needs a, a liver transplant, and she's only like a, a year old, year and a half. And then Tripp, which is a good friend of mine, Bill Van Bruggen and uh, Lori Van Bruggen's uh, grandson, Tripp, and he was diagnosed with leukemia. <clears throat> but like I told you last week, that uh, um, if you could have this type of leukemia, it's the best one you could have if that's... Uh, um, you know, if that's a good thing, and it is a good thing. So, <clears throat> so continue to pray for Ben, all right, as he navigates uh, uh, his uh, journey. And so uh, we also pray for my Aunt Kay, who is still in the hospital. I went to visit her, and she was pretty uh, disappointed in her progress. So just continue to pray for her. She's been in the hospital for two months, so uh, pray for her. So she has stage four cancer, and uh, continue to pray for her. Now, anybody else out there? <clears throat> you guys are doing so good, huh? All right, Howard. Yeah, for our nation, yes. For our nation. Every, every week I come here, it, it seems to get worse. I think it does get worse. Uh, our nation is in, in uh, a very difficult time, isn't it? Because of the leadership and the decisions they've made, <clears throat> it has uh, turned very godless. And uh, some of the things. Can you imagine, I mean, even this uh, whole... Um, thing about the abortion issue with the, with the uh, justices. Anybody who's start, uh, been in pro-life for a long time understands that the, the Roe versus Wade was a, was a horrible decision when it comes to legalities, when it comes to the Constitution, when it comes to the, just the, the law itself. It was a horrible decision. It was a political decision. And it should have been thrown out a long time ago based on that and returned to the states, which that uh, really sounds like the, the opinion. But all of a sudden now, I mean, people just apoplectic is a word, right? There, I mean, that, that we want that babies can live or that more babies can live. And really, I mean, look at the black community. Do you realize a black community, um, it's about 40% of abortions are in the black community. About 40% of all abortions come from the black community. And then this is like genocide in the black community. And yet you've got people out there saying, well, this is not fair to the black community. What? I mean, you, you call us racist. I mean, are you kidding me? So anyway, yeah, it's, but Howard, I believe that we are under the judgment of God uh, because of some of the decisions. And it will, as we're talking, it's just the power of God in the church that's withholding uh, these things. Yes, Marty. Well, they're talking about, too, kill, being able to kill the baby in 28 <clears throat> yes. days, 28 to 29 days after. Yeah, they're trying to, AB, AB 2223 out of uh, California, it's passed some, uh, some committees, and what they want to be able to do is uh, they want to be able to um, not prosecute, that's the key, anyone, uh, any family member that a baby dies within 28 days of delivery at home. Um, usually there's an investigation, an autopsy, whatever. But if that baby uh, dies after, at 20, between the 28 days after birth, then there's gonna be no investigation, no nothing, no, no they prosecution. Can't yeah. yeah, they can't investigate. They, they can't investigate. And so, so this is infanticide now. Now you get into, so uh, if you, 
you, you know, you've, you've had these horrible uh, situations where you've had these uh, children who have been uh, shaken to death, right? Uh, because they're crying and some people get out of control. I mean, that's, that's kind of scary, isn't it? That could happen. So this is where we're at, and that's why we're where we're at, I think, Howard. So pray for our nation, pray for our, our leaders, and uh, pray that the Lord, for the Lord's mercy, all right? So anybody else? All right. All right, Chris and Bill, we prayed for you already, okay? So uh, we'll continue to pray so. All right, let's open the word of God to Second Thessalonians, and I'll open a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for all these needs and some of the things like our nation, uh, totally out of our control. All we can do is vote. And that's so important for us to vote and that we make sure we make informed decisions on people uh, that are, are in our government. And, Lord, there's so much deception, so much lies uh, when it comes to those kind of things. I pray that you give us wisdom, Lord Jesus, and direction. I pray for all these um, names mentioned today, Lord Jesus, that you will just take care of them all and all these situations. We lay them at your feet and we trust you in everything, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. The question on the table is, will the church see the Antichrist? Will the church see the Antichrist? And that is a very important um, thing, right, to, to find out, to, to understand. Uh, will we see the Antichrist? Because if we see, it really has a lot to do with your eschatology. The word eschatology or eschatos means the end times or study of the last days. And so um, this is really what... Uh, um, will formulate your opinion on if you are a pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib or pre-wrath uh, something. So depending on this might help you with in your understanding of that. So let's read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to read verses uh, 1 through 12 again, and then we'll do a quick review and get started. Paul the Apostle says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord, and that's the rapture of the church, Jesus, uh, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, that's the seven years of tribulation, had already come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, that day of Christ, that seven-year tribulation will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember verse 5? Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I, I told you all these things? And now you know what is restraining that he, small h, we're going to look at that, small h, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, capital H, and so we'll talk about that, capital H, who now restrains, will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then... And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Praise the Lord. And come, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this reason, God will send them, those who rejected the truth, them strong delusion that they should and will believe the lie. So Paul the Apostle is saying concerning the coming of gathering uh, together uh, unto the Lord in verse 1, that's talking about the rapture. Uh, that's found in fir his first epistle in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. We've talked about that many times before. Paul's reminding them of that in his first epistle. He says in verse 2, he says, listen, settle down. Don't, don't get all shook up. Don't get all your minds all um, troubled, be there either by some word, by some uh, alleged person who said they've heard from the Lord and he's got a word from the Lord, or, or maybe even by a letter that I have allegedly written that somebody forged my name to. He said, that didn't happen either is what he's saying. He said that the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, the seven year of tribulation had already come and that not only did they miss the rapture, well, you're in the seven years of tribulation. And now you understand something that remember the first part of this uh, uh, chapter and in his first epistle also, they were under tremendous persecution. And so understand something that's very difficult in a Christian life. 
When you're going through something and you see something physically, you went to the doctor and you saw a report, a bad report, it's very easy to focus on the report and forget about what God's word says. Amen? It's very easy to look at the situation you're in and forget everything that you've ever believed up to that point because of the fact that everything was going good. But all of a sudden, like the reality comes in, it's like, whoa, these people are under persecution, tremendous persecution. And their outward, the things that they saw all around them by their five senses said, hey, you're in the tribulation. Do you see how open they were to Satan's lies? saying that you missed the rapture and you're in the tribulation, very open to that because the reality of their situation really kind of led credence to that. And so this is what we have to remember. When we go through difficulties, when we're in the storms of life, we can either look at the situation or we can look at the word of God and we can focus on one or the other. And boy, that's tough. That is where the rubber meets the road. But now faith is a substance of things hoped for. The what? the evidence of things not yet seen. So our faith is in something that we do not yet physically see with our own eyes or our five senses, but the reality is we trust God's word. And so that's where they were at. And so I understand these people. So I'm not throwing them in front of the bus. I'm not saying, hey, hey, you know, you guys should have known better. No, no, I'm not saying that. He says in verse three, he said, let no one deceive you by any means for that day, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, the seven years of tribulation will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The word in the Greek, therefore, let no one, it's very emphatic, it says mean, it means let absolutely no one deceive you in any respect by word or by deed or anything. So there's a lot of deception. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 4, the very first sign of the end times would be take care that no one deceives you. We have a lot of deception out there, but thank goodness, aren't you thankful that we have now the ministry of truth in our government so that we will no longer be deceived? Oh boy, thank you very, very much. We need somebody from our political left telling us what we can believe, what we can't believe, or anything like that. We were talking earlier about this new movie by the Nesuja and uh, uh, 2,000 Mules, and um, I tried to look at it last night or watch it last night. I went to, I Googled it, and immediately Google popped up this little uh, identifier and says, as, as a Google, you've set a setting that we track everything you watch, you know, in there. Is that intimidation or what, right? And we're watching you and we know what you're watching. Yeah, that's okay. You can watch whatever I'm watching, I don't care. But uh, huh? I tried to and I couldn't get, I can only see the trailer, so I'm trying to find out how I can do that. So if you know how then, huh? Yeah, he was in Mar-a-Lago, uh, what? But it, the, the point is, the point is this, is that, is that if I want to watch something, I should have enough discernment as a Christian and Holy Spirit and as a human being to decide what's right, what's wrong. That sounds good. That doesn't pass the smell test, all right? <laughs> it doesn't pass the smell test. And so it's amazing. I don't need somebody to tell me the ministry of truth. But this is deception in these last days. And ladies and gentlemen, a lot of deception is going out there. So very, be very, very clear. The word deceive means to cheat or seduce or take advantage of using trickery or a distorted appearance or an impression that they have some kind of an in track, inside track to God. Uh, the word by any means or the phrase by any means there in verse 3 means in no way, shape, or form, even if they appear genuine or sincere. For that day, again, refers back to the day of Christ, the seven years of tribulation. He goes on to say that that day will not come unless or until the falling away comes first. And we focused on that last week in our class and it was made up of two words. Uh, the first word was apo, A-P-O, and stasia. And it, the first word means away and to stand. And so it has been a translated a falling away, which is uh, used of the word apostasia. It means to stand away from. It could be translated a revolt against the established power or authority or government 
uh, the authority of God uh, it could stand for, or uh, it could mean depart, or it could mean to stand away from a physical location. You are taken from this location and taken to another location. So it can have those dual meetings there. And so that's where people say, wait a second, is this the apostasy where the church is falling away and, and, and falling away from the truth? And definitely that's part of it, no doubt. Because in Matthew 24, Jesus said one of the signs before he comes back is that the love of most in the Greek will wax cold. The love of most will wax cold for him. So we are definitely seeing the apostasia. Last week I read you the article about a, a, a super high percentage of those who call themselves evangelical Christians. 62% of that group believes that there is no Holy Spirit or no physical Holy Spirit, that he's just some type of force or ethereal uh, uh, force out there. Uh, they have no idea what their doctrine is not being taught in churches anymore. So people don't even understand. If we would get back to even some of the hymns, those are doctrines set to music. But uh, so we're seeing that apostasy. But also it can mean a physical departure, a standing away from a location. So if we took that translation, it would mean let no one deceive you by any means for that day. That, that day of the seven years of tribulation will not come unless or until the departure happens first, and then the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. So that is for you to decide my personal opinion, and I told you last week, my personal opinion, and I believe it is both. I believe that not to be a politician, but I believe it is both, that it, there is a physical departure from the faith, but also there will be a physical departure of the body of Christ. And we're going to see that uh, uh, how the, the next couple verses probably lend to that, because I believe there's strong evidence, as we'll see in the next couple of verses, that Paul is saying the key signal, the key event, the trigger, if you will, that would allow the Antichrist to come onto the scene will be the rapture of the church, the taking away of the church. Uh, that will be the signal or whatever. Um, that, no one will miss that. Absolutely no one will miss the rapture. And then and only then the son of perdition, this man of sin, this man of lawlessness will be revealed. He will be the man that we see in Revelation chapter 6 two. He's riding on a white horse. He has a Stephanos. He has a crown. But the crown is not a diadem. It's not, the, it's not the kingly crown. It's the victor's crown. He has a bow and no arrows. He comes as a man of peace. And people will accept him because he will have solutions to the world's problems. After the rapture, you know there's going to be a lot of chaos out there in the world. I mean, I hope that there's multiplied millions, I hope, in America. I don't know the percentage, but I hope there's enough in every facet of, Christ, uh, every facet of our society that will affect our society. Uh, verse 3 goes on to say that unless the falling away comes first, then the man of sin will be revealed, this son of perdition. This man of sin is a man of lawlessness or without law, one who is thrown off or discarded mor uh, God's moral laws and its restraint. We talked about this whole son of perdition, and it's very graphic in the Greek. The, the word perdition means doomed or rotten, rotten to the core, actually. It was used in the Greek for rotting meat that's covered by maggots. It's a very, uh, remember, the Greek is a very uh, word, uh, very... Uh, a word picture uh, language, and so it paints a picture. And so that's what he says. He's literally the man of stench, the man of stench, the man who brings stench, the man who brings decay. Now, remember to the world, he'll be the, the, great, the great savior, the great Messiah, the great savior of the world. But truly, in essence, that's what he is, the man of decay. Everything he touches with his progressive policies and ideas will be doomed. As we will see, the only thing holding back this rotten, stinking system led by the son of perdition is the church. Last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, the, the, uh, uh, when Jesus talked about that we are salt and light in the world. Uh, we've used for centuries salt to preserve meat, and I think the correlation is pretty clear here. This, this man of perdition, this uh, person who represents a rotten meat, if you will, the only thing holding this man back is the salt and light that God has given us in the church. Verse 4 says, back to Second Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
that phrase, who opposes, this word speaks of someone who stands in opposition or against everything that represents an established order or moral norms. He will be the opposite. He will be antichrist. Remember, the word antichrist uh, has two, a dual meaning. It can mean um, against Christ or can it mean alongside of Christ or a pseudo Christ. So remember, he's going to come in as a pseudo Christ. He's going to come in as a, as a savior of the world. But truly, in essence, he is an antichrist. Everything he does subvertly and covertly is literally against Christ and against all his moral norms. You're going to see sin take off like you've never taken it off before. And we have seen a lot of sin, haven't we? Just rampant. All the, 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 the guardrails have been pulled down by our society that what is normal, what is right is wrong, what is wrong is right, what is white is black, what is black is white, and that's exactly what Isaiah 55, Isaiah 5, 20 says it's going to be like. So this is who he is. He will seek to exalt himself, it says, which speaks of his sense of his superiority over not only God, but over all religions. The Antichrist will really set himself up as the one and only God over all religions. He will sit in the temple of God. And the words here are really incredible in the original text because the words here that are used to describe the temple in the Bible uh, is the same words, I should say, that are used in the Bible to represent the physical temple of God in the Old and, and New Testament times of Jesus and the Holy of Holies. It's the same word. So what do we know by that? Well, we know that a third temple has to be built. Praise the Lord, right? We know it has to be built in order for him to sit in this temple. Same wording that's used of the Holy Temple of God in the Old and New Testament uh, before it was destroyed in 70 AD. And so this temple has to be rebuilt. That's why it's so exciting when you, when you hear about things like the, the, the red heifer. We've talked about before out of uh, Numbers chapter 19, the red heifer is so important and, and so necessary to the end time Bible prophecy. Uh, if you don't know anything about the red heifer, I'll give you a little Cliff's notes on it, okay? The red heifer in the Old Testament, it sounds kind of weird, uh, but the red heifer was, was an animal and it was, had to be under three years old. It could never have done any kind of work whatsoever, never plowed a field or anything like that. It could not have any more than two, some people say three, but mostly people say two non-rared hairs on its entire body. It was believed to be of, of divine origin where, where God would supernaturally allow this red heifer to be born, what would happen is they would sacrifice this red heifer. And if you read Numbers chapter 19, I think it's verses like uh, 1 through 13, I think it is, uh, you'll see that it was used uh, as, he, as the, the animal sacrifice. The ashes were mixed with water and it went into a purification ceremony that purified anyone who would come into the temple or on the temple mount or anything like that. Because it would very clear in that passage of scripture, if you had come near a dead body or anything like that, that you were uh, ceremonially unclean and had to be clean. Well, how significant is this that in 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, they lost, they lost the remaining ashes that they had for purification. So since 70 AD, no one's been able to do anything regarding the temple, although they were kicked out of the land anyway, uh, in the diaspora, they call it. Uh, they were kicked out all around the world until God brought them back in 1948. And all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, people are talking about the third temple and the rebuilding of the temple. And interestingly enough, uh, through genetic engineering, this hasn't been a divine thing, genetic engineering, they have believed to have produced a red heifer and it's been certified most believe it's very secretive but they believe that one has been certified and it's already been sacrificed they have the ashes uh, they've did they, they've done a mock uh, uh, sacrifice of a another animal that wasn't an, uh, the red heifer but another animal to see how much ashes would be produced from this animal because they wanted to make sure that they had enough ashes to mix with water to, to ceremonially cleanse every Jew in the entire known world. And it's been multiplied 10, 20 times more than that. They have more than enough. So the interesting thing is that the rabbis teach, this is the interesting point, 
the, the rabbis teach that there will only be 10 red heifers born in all of human history. Nine have been, been born. Uh, that The ninth one was the ninth one back in 70 AD, way back when. And there hasn't been another one for this period of time. And now if this is the 10th one, the rabbis say the 10th one will signify the Messiah's return. How cool is that? So the Messiah will not be our Messiah. That will be taken up in the rapture. But it would be the world's Messiah, their Antichrist. And the Jews will fall into that deception because the Antichrist, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, it will tell them that he will have a covenant with the nation of Israel for one seven-year period. Does that sound interesting? Huh? One seven-year period and allow them to rebuild their temple and worship uh, because during that halfway period of time, the Antichrist will come into the temple and he will defy or, or um, desecrate the temple because he will say that he is God and then the Israelites will realize we have followed a false messiah. Yes, Jackie. Okay, so what happens to the, the temple that's up there now? It, will it be destroyed in order to put up the third temple? There is no temple now there. That, I mean, the one on the rock, you know, that, no, well, that you're, you're talking about the Dome of the Rock. You're talking about the Dome of the Rock. Yeah, um, there's a lot of uh, controversy about that, uh, and and many scholars believe that that is not the place of the, of the last temple. Many believe it's next to it, adjacent to that. Well, I know that because there's a, a gazebo, a small gazebo, just to the mm -hmm. left of the front <clears throat> right. of that mosque. Right. So I just wondered. Yeah, I don't. I mosque. yeah, I don't believe that. I I don't personally believe. That well, I don't know, Jackie. I won't be here. So, but uh, uh, next to that, you're right where the gazebo is. Many people believe that that area is where the the true um, third, uh, second temple that was destroyed was at, and it's not the Al Aqsa um, uh, Mosque over there, the Dome of the Rock that was known as Dome of the Rock. So uh, that would be uh, extremely controversial, don't you think? Um, I think uh, uh, so. So, it, Lord's got that all worked out. Yeah, Mary. Or is that um... Orthodox? Yeah. Yeah, there's pretty much, uh, yeah, it's not, it's, it's, we would call it a, a fringe group because it's not necessarily a majority uh, in Israel because Israel is very secular, extremely secular. If you go to Tel Aviv, um, it is the homosexual capital uh, of, of Israel. Uh, when I was in Israel twice in Tel Aviv, I mean, uh, it's really the, it's, it's kind of the, uh, the key west, <laughs> the key west of, of uh, Israel and stuff. But so it's a very secular uh, in Israel. There's, uh, but the Orthodox Jews and there's a, a sect of them who naturally wants to have the the, uh, the third temple because they've not been able to sacrifice uh, since uh, since 70 A.D. And so this Day of Atonement, uh, it, it's a, they have to do through, jump through all kinds of theological hoops for them to really believe that their sins have been atoned for, right? Because they've never had a blood sacrifice. They've never had a lamb to be all, all offered. So I um, hope that answers your question. But that's called the Temple Faithful. And if you get a chance to go to Israel, you got to go to the Temple Institute. If you you got to go there, uh, if you understand this whole thing, because I was there and and uh, uh, some of the other people I was with didn't know the background of, of things and they they uh, they didn't understand it. But everything is ready. Everything they they even found um, the the little snail that produces the the the, the Prussian type blue that goes into the garment of the of the uh, the high priest. It had to be a specific blue color dye it had to be and for centuries it was lost until they found this little snail and that's what they produced they got this little snail there and it's like like a little drop out of every snail that they produce it's really cool the garments already the, the ooh, i get the chills that the high priest the garments already already made up and stuff they got the ark of the ark of the covenant there remade they've got everything that's necessary for that third temple so it's what's that the stones, every all the Marty, all the stones from like the Abrahamic time, right? The twelve tribes and stuff, and it's really interesting. So, all right. So this, he's going to exalt himself above all that is called God, and he's going to enter this rebuilt third temple. So it's interesting. Now, here's here's really a scary part. Okay, it says right here, showing himself to be God, showing himself to be God. This word in the Greek is. 
It's pretty scary in one regard, but this is how completely he will be able to deceive people. This word showing describes someone uh, that has a form, uh, uh, describes some form of outward, observable, or vis- visible presentation that he will use to authenticate or prove to the world that he is God. It is the same exact word used in the New Testament to describe the signs and wonders that the Holy Spirit used to validate Christ's ministry and the apostles' ministry. It's the same word. It's the same word. He will do, he will do literal miracles. Okay, hold Second Thessalonians, put a uh, bookmark in there and turn with me to Revelation chapter 13 and we'll see how this is going to play out. Revelation chapter 13. It is amazing that he will be able to do these lying wonders and these wonders are going to be so of a, of a type that the world will believe that he is truly God. Revelation 13. I want you to understand something that in Revelation chapter 12, if you want to look over to verse 9, it tells us a description of who uh, will empower the Antichrist. And we'll read that in a second. But in verse 9, it says, so the great dragon was cast out. He's talking about being cast out of heaven. The old serpent called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. And he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 12 says, therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, the sea is the humanity. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows his time is short. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Satan, the dragon, uh, he's known here as a dragon. This is Satan of old. It tells us very uh, clearly here. He's the uh, serpent of old, the devil, Satan. Now, he is who empowers the Antichrist. I was explaining, I forgot what it was uh, last week. I was explaining to somebody, maybe it was Danielle, that um, I think it was Danielle. We were talking about how that we as Christians desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Right empowered with. The word filled with is, if I use the phrase, he was filled with rage. What does that mean? He was controlled with rage. He was just uh, overcome by rage. So if I'm filled with the Spirit, I'm literally controlled by or overcome by the Holy Spirit. Satan will infill or fill the Antichrist with all his power and all his authority. And you don't think he has a lot of power and authority. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says that the God of this world, who is the God of this world? Is it Jesus? That's right. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. When Adam and Eve sinned, they literally turned over the title deed to the world to the enemy, and he's been in possession of that. We know that from Luke chapter 4, where one of the, one of the temptations of Jesus was he promised him, he took him to a high pinnacle and showed him the kingdoms of the earth, and he said, I'll give you these. Well, it wasn't a valid offer. It wasn't his. It was his. And he said, if you worship me, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. Satan is the God of this world, and he has tremendous power and authority, except Dorothy, he's on a short leash. God allows him. So don't ever think as a believer, oh, my Lord, oh, Satan's going to put cancer on me, or Satan's going to get me in a car accident, or Satan's going to do this, oh, no, and live in fear. No. No, that is not the truth. Listen, I've been through a lot. I've been through a fatal accident. Uh, I've been through a lot of things in my life. Some of the things I've I've not even been able to share with you uh, here that I've shared out of the country, but not not in America. The things I've been through, but none of those things, none of those things did Satan do or or to me uh, apart from God's perfect and complete will for my life. God allowed these things. And when you understand that, then you understand that God has a purpose. And he says he's trying to get our attention or draw us nearer to him. And sometimes we're just such a bunch of rockheads. It takes a while for us to figure that out, right? But so we're going to see that Satan empowers the Antichrist. We're going to see that. So Revelation chapter 13, we're going to read verses 2. Well, let's read verses 1 through 8. Okay. Uh, John says, and I stood on the sand of the sea and uh, I saw a beast rising out of the sea, out of humanity, having seven heads and ten horns. And we see that all the way back to Daniel chapter 7, verse 2 and verse 7, that he had these ten horns and on his horns ten crowns and on his heads blasphemous names. 
Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and in his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, we know the dragon from verse 9 of chapter 12 of Revelation, that's the Satan himself. The dragon gave who? Gave him, the Antichrist, his power, his throne, and great authority. And I saw one of the heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed and all the world marveled and followed at the beast. Zechariah chapter 11 verse uh, 17, I believe, uh, talks about the woeful shepherd and it talks about this, uh, this wound that he's uh, in, in his head and in his right arm becomes withered. And it's really a belief that many scholars have that, that someone will try to kill the Antichrist. And uh, well, I don't believe, some believe he'll, be, he'll die and raise from the dead. I don't believe that. But he'll give a, uh, an appearance as if he was dead and rose from the dead. And uh, there'll be a mortal wound in his head and his right arm will be paralyzed, if you will, or whatever. And that's where many scholars believe the reason why you have the mark of the beast in the forehead or the right hand, to identify with him. I don't know, but that's some of the people say that. So I just, that was no charge, okay? I just throw that out there for you. All right. But that's in Zechariah eleven seventeen. You can look that up. So they, they who? The world, the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. See, ultimately, it's about Satan worship and gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given. Now, I've got these all highlighted in my Bible. And I'd like you to, maybe if you, if you highlight your Bible, I highlight them in my Bible. He, small h, the Antichrist, was given a mouth to speak great things and blasphemies. And he was given, and I highlight that, authority to continue to, for 42 months. This last three and a half years is where he's really going to come on the scene and Satan's going to really empower him. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. That's us. Because he, has, he can't touch us. It was granted. It was given to him. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And the authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. Understand those saints there. Those saints are not you and me. Those are tribulation saints. These are the ones we see in Revelation chapter 7 who came out of... Uh, uh, through, through the witness of the 144,000 and the two witnesses, they came to a saving knowledge of Christ. And so these saints were called tribulation saints. They were under the control of the enemy, and they will, unfortunately, many be martyred for the cause of Christ. Now, verse 8 says, And who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life, of the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Let's pick it up in verse 11. And then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. This is the, the false prophet. And he had two horns like a lamb, lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist, in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it. You're always going to see this in the Bible. It differentiates us from them, the earth dwellers. Those who dwell on the earth. These are the people who are tied into this earth system who will worship the beast who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs. Here's the verse. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth. You see that again? He deceives those who dwell on the earth by the signs which he was granted to do granted to do. This is God allowing this in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth, he keeps it saying that, to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. And he was granted, again, power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes both small and, and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then verse 18, you know, that's the, the number 666. So do we see anything like this, that, that he had be able to do these lying wonders, the same word used for signs and wonders that Christ used and was used of the apostles in the first century? Do we see anything like that in the Bible? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, 
Paul mentions these two guys named Janus and Jambres, who rabbi scholars believe these were the two main magicians that were in Pharaoh's court back in the day of Moses. Remember when Moses and Aaron came into Pharaoh and, and Moses had the word to let my people go, right? He's got the rod and Aaron's got the rod. You let my people go and Pharaoh. And so to demonstrate his power, Aaron throws his rod down and it becomes a serpent actually. That was in Exodus chapter 7, verse 11 and 12, I believe. And so he throws this, this uh, rod down and it became a serpent. Well, these magicians in Pharaoh's court, what did they do? They conjured up and they did the same thing. The only thing cool about it, right, Mary? What happened? Uh, Aaron's, Aaron's snake ate their snake all up, right? So that was pretty cool, right? And they were able to duplicate some of the uh, signs because uh, Moses and Aaron left. They come back again, let my people go. And so now another plague comes. And they were able to even duplicate the water and the blood uh, situation. But in Exodus chapter 8, verse 19, there came a point where these magicians could no longer duplicate these magi- these, these these magical things that they were saying that he's done this under magic. And they said there, he said the magicians were powerless and they told the Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So we see that Satan has tremendous power and deceptive ability, but God is in control. Satan, although he's very powerful, he's on a short chain because he was granted, granted these things to be able to do. So turn back to 2 Thessalonians and we'll continue. Paul is saying in verse 5, he says, Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you all these things? Paul the apostle was saying, didn't, didn't you get my YouTube? Didn't you listen to me on YouTube? I told you all these things. When I, when I was with you before, I was with you for three weeks. Uh, when Back in the book of Acts, chapter 17, I was with you for three weeks. I told you all these things. I warned you. I told you about the rapture. I told you about the tribulation. I told you about the Antichrist. Don't you remember these things? But remember, they were under persecution. And because of what they saw and felt, a lot of the things that were not written down, that were in their memory, had faded. And Satan, which is the master of our brain right up here. This is the battleground, ladies and gentlemen. I'll say it again and again in in my ministry. This is the battleground right here, my thought process. Because I've got a choice to believe what I see and what I feel, or I believe God's word. And oftentimes, it's a struggle, isn't it, Daniel? It's a struggle every day, honey. We talk about it, right? It's a struggle to do what's right and the world is doing wrong. All of a sudden, that that you realize that you you start compromising, don't you? At least in my life, I mean, I start compromising of things that I used to stand for this and be strong. And all of a sudden, well, maybe that's not, you know. You can start thinking that, right? Because the world is so polluted that we start getting infected by the things of the world. And it draws down our standards a little bit. I'm not talking about gross immorality. I'm just talking about some of the things you watch on TV or things like that that I allow to come in. So uh, this is what happened to them. He says, listen, didn't you watch my new YouTube or did, didn't you take notes? Didn't you get my hand out? Paul says, didn't you, didn't you follow my outline? I had all those really nice bullet points. You know, my three-point sermon was with you. I'm just kidding here, right? But often he said, didn't, don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? Remember, in Paul's first epistle to him, to them. He did not mention the coming of the Antichrist because, as we will see, Paul knows that the church will not see him, and he had already talked to them about these things because that's what he's alluding to in this passage of Scripture right here, that I've already told you about these things. I've told you about the day of the Lord. I've told you about the rapture of the church. I've told you about this man of sin, this one who one day will sit in the temple of God claiming to be God. Remember, nowhere in Paul's first letter did he warn them that they would be going through any part of the seven years of tribulation. And I find this personally as a person who believes in the pre-tribulation rapture that I believe this passage is going to show you, I think, really strongly. If you, You'll make up your own mind, but I believe Paul is going to show you very strongly in the Word of God that we will not be here when the Antichrist is revealed. And aren't you glad about that? 
Because if you're here when the Antichrist is here, we are in deep doo-doo, shall I say, theologically speaking, okay? I like that for a theological word in the Greek, okay? Doo-doo, okay? Bad things gonna happen. So Mark's gonna be stoned as a heretic, <laughs> and, and, and uh, you will never see me before. I, again, I'm going underground, okay? No, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I thank the Lord that we're gonna look at some passages about that. But Paul never warned them as a first epistle uh, when he talked about the rapture, he never warned them. In any of his epistles, he does not warn the church, the Gentile believers, the bride of Christ, that they are going to go through the tribulation. He doesn't warn them. And I find that interesting because I know Paul the Apostle, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, would warn the church to warn people, say, listen, Bill, guess what? You know, you're going to go through the tribulation, so this is what you need to do. You need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, and do because you're going to be going through this period of time, and this is how you sustain yourself during this period of time. He would, but he doesn't tell us that, and I find that very interesting. So, yes, yes, he clearly said they will expect and should expect persecution. In fact, they were appointed to this persecution. We read that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 3 and 4, that they were under tremendous persecution and a man tribulation, if you will. But that tribulation and that persecution is not the great tribulation. It's not the seven years of tribulation. In fact, Paul the Apostle will go on in his first letter in, in chapter 5, verse 9, and he will tell them, he says, and we, the children of light, are not like the children of darkness. And we are not appointed to or ordained to or destined to God's wrath. And that is what the whole seven years of tribulation is all about. God pouring out his wrath. But he goes on to say that we're not appointed or ordained or destined to suffer God's wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. The word salvation there in the Greek means deliverance or rescue. How do you like that, huh? Praise the Lord. Deliverance or rescue. That's what we're ordained for, to be rescued, delivered before the wrath of God. Okay. I want you to hold Thess Thessalonians again, and I want you to turn back to Romans chapter 5 to kind of put this to, to bed to understand that we are not under God's wrath. Praise the Lord. We are not under God's wrath. We know from a very famous passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Right, Al? There is thou therefore no condemnation. There is no judgment to those who are in Christ Jesus. Remember that word, in Christ Jesus. Please always remember this when you read in Christ Jesus. In the picture in the Greek, Andrea, it's a picture of a circle with a dot in the middle. The circle represents God and his power and his authority and his majesty, and the dot represents you. <laughs> we are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can get to us without the permissive will of a holy God. Doesn't that encourage you? Praise the Lord. We are in Christ Jesus. And there is no condemnation. There is no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why, Daniel? Because he took all our judgment. He took every ounce of God's judgment upon himself. God poured out his wrath. And the book of Isaiah says, and he looked upon him, talking about his son, Jesus Christ, and he looked upon him in travail, and he was satisfied. Justice was satisfied. I think that is so incredible. I get tears in my eyes thinking about it. His justice, his holy, righteous judgment for sin that had to be paid for. God is a holy God. He couldn't wink at sin. He couldn't just say, okay, you're a nice little kid, like your grandmother would pat you on your head when you they did something wrong. Oh, isn't that cute? Isn't... No, God's a holy God. Sin had to be paid for. So what? God had a problem. You think about it, God had a problem. How could he deal with sin and pay for sin? The only thing in all of eternity that was found to satisfy his holiness was his own, own blood, himself. God, in essence, through the, third, the second person of the Godhead, through the God-man Jesus Christ, hung on the cross and he paid the price and because of his price that was paid, that he was satisfied. His holiness, his judgment was satisfied. 
You understand that the seven years of tribulation is really Daniel's 70th week. It's determined, uh, it was determined upon Israel to drive them to their knees. And for the earth dwellers, the judgment comes upon them for punishment for rejecting sin. But even during that period of time, you're going to see thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people coming to know Christ. Well, Romans chapter 5, let's pick it up in verse 1 and see if we can go through this real quickly. Uh, Romans chapter 5, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Paul the Apostle in chapter 4 was talking about that imputed righteousness. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, how God has written a check, if you will, I like to say, written a check. His righteousness is in your account, and all you got to do is cash the check by faith. But many people won't cash that check by faith. They hesitate. And God says it's in your account, a righteousness, an imputed righteousness, something credited to to your account. Chapter 5 says, therefore, in light of the fact that you have this imputed righteousness. Therefore, having, excuse me, been justified by faith. You understand in the Greek, that is a past tense of the verb. You already have been justified. When Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus said, it is finished, it was done, Marty. Done. Bill, it's done. It's over with. If you have faith in that, it doesn't matter. I know we talked a couple last last week and Bill wasn't here. We talked about you, Bill. Okay. Said that sometimes some of us struggle with our salvation because we realize that every day we don't really live up to his standards. Can anybody raise your hand and tell me every day? Every day I don't live up to his standards, I know, right? But you know what? Praise the Lord that we have been justified. He died for our past, present, and future sins. And I'm not trusting in my own righteousness. I'm not trusting in my ability to perfect live out the holy life every day in word or in deed or in thought. If that's the case, I'm, I'm doomed. I'm done. But I have been justified by the blood of Jesus Christ and I'm trusting in that. Therefore, having been justified by what? By faith. By faith. We have peace or shalom with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've been reconciled to God, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We've been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We stand in God's grace by faith, not in our works, and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in our tribulations. Hey, how'd that get in there? (laughs) We also glory in our tribulations, knowing that our tribulations, our, our difficulties, our trials, our tests produce perseverance. And perseverance produces character and, per- and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given us. Kind of sounds like James chapter 1, doesn't it? Same thing, but James talking. Verse 6 says, for when we were still without strength. Oh, I love this passage. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for who? The good people? The people that were going to church and paying their tithes and reading the Bible every day. Is that who Jesus died for? Jesus died for the ungodly. Oh, that's me. Hello. (laughs) He died for the ungodly. Those who were godless. People who were apart from Christ. He says in verse 7, for scarcely for a righteous man. Well, maybe somebody would die. Yeah, perhaps for a good man, some would. Well, they might even dare to die. Verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still in our sins, Christ died for us. Before we ever knew him, Al, he knew us. You know what? The book of Hebrews says in chapter 12, it says that, um, um, I'm I'm going to misquote it now. I better get it. Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Okay, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Uh, That word there, uh, the joy set before him, uh, some people say the joy was his reinstatement in heaven to go back to the, the right hand of the Father. And other theologians, which I believe, you know what the joy that was set before him? You know why he endured the cross? Because he saw you, Mary. He saw you. He saw me. He saw you, Michael. He saw you. He saw me. He saw you on the cross. And that was the joy. 
The joy knowing that his sacrifice would bring all these people to Jesus to himself. And that was a joy set before him. And that's why he endured the cross. Yes, God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more than, here's the verse, talking about the tribulation. Much more than having been justified by his blood, past tense, we shall be saved, delivered, rescued from what? Wrath. Wrath. From wrath through him. We are not under the wrath of God. We will not be under the wrath of God. And praise God, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we are sealed in him. So turn back to Second Thessalonians. And we'll get onto it. I'm wrapping things up here. Second Thessalonians. <clears throat> oh, what a promise. Oh, what a promise we have from Jesus Christ. It says, verse 6, and now we know what is restraining that he, I want you to notice in your text here, if you're reading the word, I want you to know the, the word he has a small h there. I want you to notice that because the translators are, are giving us indication. We will see in a, in a second in verse 7 that, that there's going to be another he, but it's going to be capitalized. And so he's talking about two different Entities, two different people, if you will. Now, we know what is restraining that he, the Antichrist, may be revealed in his own time. Uh, this is the man of sin, this he here, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the man of rot and decay. He is the Antichrist. In his season is a time period planned or ordained by God himself, planned or ordained by God himself. So the $64,000 question is this. Who is restraining? Who is holding back uh, this unveiling of the man of sin? Who or what is restraining or holding back this man of sin? Because the word restrain means there is the word in the Greek, ket echo, K-A-T-E-C-H-O, ket echo, which means to hold down or hold back by force or to suppress or to restrain or to hinder. So again, the big question is who or what is restraining and holding back and suppressing this evil or this man of sin, this son of perdition, this antichrist from being revealed. Now we know ultimately, we all know that ultimately God is holding back evil. We know that. But what is the method? What is the method that God is using to hold back this evil? So some in the first century believed that it was actually the Roman Senate because the, uh, the Neros and the emperors got out of control and, and the Senate would kind of keep them in check, kind of like our Senate and Congress is supposed to do in, in our uh, system of government. In fact, our system of government is based much on the Roman system. Some said in the first century it was Michael the Archangel. That was what he was withholding the Antichrist and withholding evil, if you will. And some said that, well, one day God will remove the Holy Spirit from the world and then, and then the Antichrist will be able to come in. Well, if that's true, uh, that doesn't make sense because Psalms 139, if you want to hold uh, 2 Thessalonians, Psalms 139, uh, I got it marked in your Bible, tells us that we can never get away from his spirit. Psalms 139, verse 7, Psalms 39, verse 7 says, uh, the psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand shall uphold me. No, it's not the, the, the Holy Spirit himself that will be taken out of the world because we know that during the tribulation, we see multiplied thousands, probably millions of people will come to know Jesus Christ during that time. And we know the Bible tells us in John 6, that no man comes to the Father, right? Nobody can come unto Jesus except the Father draws him. Draws him by who? By the Holy Spirit. So we know the Holy Spirit himself will not be taken out of the world, but is it giving us kind of an indication that most scholars believe that he's referring to this rapture of the church or the taking away of the church? We are the containers. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit in this world. We are salt and light. That's what Jesus told us in Matthew chapter 5, right? 
We're the salt and light. We're the preserving power and presence in the world from stopping the world's decay and rot. And we are losing a lot of influence, are we not? Because we've been mingled with the world. Remember, it says in that passage that it becomes good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. Pure salt was very important, but salt that was filled with impurities was really good for nothing, Jesus said. And so we've been contaminated, but we're the light of the world, and that's what we are supposed to do. We are supposed to send, shed the, the light of Jesus Christ on a dark world. The Holy Spirit himself will not be removed, but the Holy Spirit's influence and the preserving effect of the church, the body of Christ, on the decaying, rotting world will be removed, and the restraining effect or the power will be removed. Let me say that again. I believe, and I believe most theologians who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, as, as this passage will show us, believe that the Holy Spirit himself will not be removed, but the Holy Spirit's influence and preserving effect of the church in the body of Christ will be removed, and so the Antichrist will be revealed. Our when we're out of here, that will open up the door. The restrainer is the church. Once removed, we'll then allow or open the door so that the Antichrist and his system can be revealed. We also have a great clue, and I'll probably end up with this. We have a, really have a great clue in, uh, in this word revealed in verse 6. In verse 6 it says, And now you know what, what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. This word revealed means something that is unveiled or, or that has been hidden, but suddenly, immediately, suddenly comes into clear focus or visible. It's like he's standing behind a curtain and then something happens that allows him to come front and center that fast, all right? It has been hidden or concealed is the son of decay, the son of rot. The question is, what will be the event or what will be the situation that will occur in the world that will open the door and suddenly allow or reveal the Antichrist to appear and masquerade as the world's savior? You as good Bereans got to think about that. You think about that. Okay, Mary. You know, what you're talking about, I was thinking is maybe it's semantics of the church being pulled out or not. But I think it's the dwelling of the world. That, that the Holy Spirit isn't going to dwell in humans anymore. And so obviously that would mean the church would have to be removed. But we know in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit came upon people, but it wasn't within them. And so that that's the way I think of that question. Yes, and, and if I didn't clarify that again, I'll clarify. It is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the church, in the bride of Christ, in the, bo in the body of Christ that will be removed. That uh, the indwelling influence, shall I say. <clears throat> but during the tribulation, um, once again, these are going to be real born-again Christians that are going to believe in Christ and accept him, accept the witness or accept the gospel. And so the Holy Spirit is going to have to draw them. And I also believe that he will probably, he will indwell them just like uh, he does a church. So my personal opinion, we don't know. It does The, the text doesn't really say, but um, I don't necessarily know if there'll be, uh, we talked a little bit about that before, about the, the resurrection, you know. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, so that, that it's the influence uh, in, in, in the body of Christ in the church that will be removed. And then suddenly he comes visible. <clears throat> what has been hidden or concealed is this son of decay. And again, what is the question you have to answer is what is the event or situation that will occur in the world that would open the door suddenly, immediately to reveal or allow this Antichrist to appear and masquerade as the world's savior? I believe, and I've told you before, <clears throat> that, uh, and I'll read a direct translation and I'll end. But I believe, and this is my theology, and uh, people, you can disagree if you want, but I think it fits. I believe the Antichrist is living today. He's in the world today. Do you believe that? He doesn't know he's the Antichrist. He doesn't know he's the Antichrist, or he doesn't know he will be the Antichrist. But Satan has his eye, I believe, on somebody all the way down history. Because Satan doesn't know when the rapture of the church will come. He doesn't know, but he knows as soon as that happens... Boom, suddenly, suddenly a veil is going to be open and a curtain is going to be open and he's going to step out on 
on the world scene. There's somebody he is going to empower that we saw that in Revelation chapter 13 with all his power, with all his authority. So he's got his best eye on somebody and somebody out there is going to open themselves up to the enemy to ask to be filled with, to ask to be empowered by And God says, you the man. Uh, or Satan's going to say, you're the man. And God's going to say, okay, I'm going to allow that to happen. So I believe he's in the world today. I believe that he is in a place of authority, uh, some place in the world. He's, he might not be in some place that we, we look at and we say, oh, yeah, he's the one. Uh, because we all got those names and people got, got it wrong for centuries. Uh, remember, they thought Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. Trump was the Antichrist, by the way, for many people and, and other, other people. So, um, no, um, I believe that God's got, got, got a man in a place of position of power today and, uh, and just ready. When the rapture happens, he's going to step in. So that event or that situation will occur and then suddenly the door will be open and revealed because that's what the word means, revealed. Suddenly, clear, invisible. I believe the next few verses will show, show us. Did somebody say something? Yeah, I'm sorry. Matthew 24 is not for us, Anna. Matthew 24 is not for the church. Matthew 24 was written to the Jews. Matthew 24, the, the, the signs that he has there, if you look at the chapter 6 of Revelation, you'll almost see a direct correlation, a direct, a direct correlation to those signs. And he's talking to the Jews there, Anna, because remember the church wasn't even born at that time in, in, in Matthew chapter 24. And also he talks about uh, the day of the Sabbath. Woe unto you, pray that it's not on the Sabbath. That's not for the church, that's for the Jews. So those signs, there is no sign that has to be fulfilled, if you will, uh, for the Lord to return for the church. Uh, all, all the signs, the signs that he says there are often in the book of the Revelation, and those are future, the signs of famine and war and all those things. Now, those have been all through history, but they will culminate during the, during the, uh, during the book of the Revelation. So many people hang on to that thought, Anna, and I'm not saying you do, but many people have hung on to that saying, hey, the Lord is not coming back. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about that on the tape. I just kicked some, but I'm, I was going to put my foot up here, you know, like on a recliner, put my foot up and say, you know, yeah, I got plenty of time. All the signs have not been revealed. And you know what? That biggest sign, that biggest sign is that this gospel has to be preached throughout the whole world. And then the end will come. Really? Okay. Let's look at that verse. And then the end, what is the end? The end is the end. The end is not the rapture. It's the end end. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached. The gospel of the kingdom, hello, we can go into that. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached and then the end will come. So remember Anna in Revelation chapter 14, there's these three angels and they're going throughout heaven. One of the angels is preaching the everlasting gospel. I love it. So I'm glad you brought this up, Anna. Thank you. Revelation chapter 14 says this. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 14. And I saw another angel, verse 6, Revelation 14, 6. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. Remember who those people are? The earth dwellers. These are the people who are not tribulation saints. They're not born again, but he has given them one last opportunity. And he's preaching to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, that's everybody, everybody, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. One last time, an angel from heaven is going to be in the heavens proclaiming the everlasting gospel to every man, woman, and child, every tongue, tribe, and nation. Why? Because he's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Maybe this 144,000 missed miss this person, missed this tribe, missed this people in the Amazon. Missed it. But you know what? Oh, maybe the two witnesses, they didn't, they didn't see it on YouTube. They didn't see it on TV. The two witnesses, they didn't see it on CNN. But you know what? The angel of the Lord is going to preach it. The gospel given every person opportunity to say, listen, give him glory. It's your last chance. And the other ones going on, and you'll read the other, other uh, two um, 
angels, and they're begging people, don't take the mark of the beast. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't, and it's not in there. <laughs> don't do it, or you're going to damn yourself to hell for eternity. So God in his mercy. So uh, actually it's called, uh, and it's called the doctrine of eminency, and not everybody believes it. If you're mid-trib position, or post-trib, you definitely do, don't believe in the doctrine of eminency. But the doctrine of eminency teaches that Jesus Christ could come at any period of time. There is nothing that has to be fulfilled before he can return for his church, okay? There are signs that are going to go in the future. And we see that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Paul the Apostle goes on in chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, where it says, we which are alive and remain will be caught up together, right? What? We? He's talking about himself. He was believing that Jesus Christ could come back in his day and his age. He was looking for the return of Christ. And we know now that there's been that parentheses, if you will, uh, that God can bring in the Gentile church. And aren't you glad about that? That there's been a 2,000, almost 2,000 year gap in there from, from the time of Christ and, and before, you know, Paul the Apostle gets the gospel right Marty hates to bring this up, so you know what's going to happen, right? <clears throat> okay, Marty. The reason why I say this is because a lot of people, I believe, because I didn't know at first neither, that if you know the Word of God and you miss, let's say you miss the tribulation, that some people think... You missed the rapture. The rapture, I mean. Some people think they have a second chance to get there, but isn't it if you knew the Word of God that you don't have that second chance? Well, we're going to look at that passage of Scripture, Marty, and, and uh, it, it seems to, to tell us that in verse 10 and 11 of this same passage, that those who've rejected Christ, um, yeah, some believe, some believe, Marty, that if you've rejected the gospel and the rapture happens, that you will not have a second chance. Some believe that. I pray that's not true, to be honest with you, okay? I, I pray that that's not true, but some, some theologians are pretty strong on that, saying, no, you missed your opportunity. Um, I, I hope not because I see the grace and mercy of God, but remember, if you're found in the tribulation, this is not going to be a good time, sports fans. If you're a mid-tribulation person even, it's not going to be a good time because you can see the way our government is headed for persecution for the Christian church already. Can you imagine when the Antichrist comes on the scene? No, you're going to end up being beheaded for the cause of Christ or starving to death or something uh, during the tribulation. You're going to have to give your life for the Lord. And so I tell people, I said, listen, you think you're going to wait for a second chance during the tribulation, really? Oh, I'm, when, when the rapture happens, then I'm going to know you guys are all right. Yeah, I gotta know the Bible was true. And then I'm gonna accept the Lord. I said, really? You think you can come to the Lord anytime you want? Huh? The Bible tells me that you can't come to the Father except He draws you. So you know what I believe He's drawing you now. Today is a day of salvation, my friend. Harden not your heart. Hebrews says, today is a day of salvation, not tomorrow, not a week from now. Harden not your heart, because when you do harden your heart today, it gets harder tomorrow and harder the next day, and harder the next day, and it doesn't soften, it gets harder. Every time you reject the Lord, every time you reject his call, you become a little harder and a little harder. And I pray in the name of Jesus, if you're there like that, that you will soften your heart today. I'm gonna close, okay? Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that we have so many great promises, Lord, that we are not subject to and we are not destined for to suffer under your wrath. Lord Jesus, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you have redeemed us from all that, from any kind of judgment, any kind of wrath that you would pour out upon this world. The world has rejected you. We have not rejected you. And so, Lord, we are going to be received by you through the rapture, and then the Antichrist is going to appear, and then the seven years of tribulation. Lord, we pray for all those today who are in the sound of my voice, who are hearing this by YouTube. If you are on the fence, if God is speaking to your heart, harden not your heart. Today is a day of salvation. Cry out to the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, would you please forgive me for my sins? Would you come into my life? Will you change me from the inside out? And give me the witness of your spirit that I know that I'm born again by the spirit of God. And I can tell you, if you do that, the Bible tells me and it will tell you that you are now born again and on your way to heaven. And now it's time to grow in Christ. In your name we pray, amen. God bless you. And can I tell you one thing too? If you put in prayer, uh, 